Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, perhaps for some. Welcome, everybody, to this, the official launch of the book, The Impact of the International Livestock Research Institute, Looking Back to Accelerate Future Food Systems Transformation. We're really pleased you've joined us. I know a lot of people have signed up and we're seeing many participants join in and many old friends and colleagues greeting each other in the chat. Keep it up. My name is Shirley Tarawali. I'm Assistant Director General at ILRI and I'll be your moderator today. At today's official launch, we're going to hear more about the science that's profiled in the book, covering over four decades of work by ILRI and its predecessors, the International Livestock Center for Africa, ILCA in Ethiopia, and the International Laboratory for Research on Animal Diseases, ILRAD in Kenya. And the multigral, integral, essential partners, many of you online today. We've assembled three great panels, each of them convened by lead authors and scientists, covering three main research areas. We'll hear about animal genetics, production and health, valuing a systems approach to securing feed and forage resources, tropical livestock systems and policies. In different ways, each of those systems will explore key issues related to science excellence, partnerships, capacity development and impact. And then we'll conclude with a short session considering how to build on this fantastic work in the context of the new one CJR research and innovation strategy. So to get us started now, let me welcome ILRI Director General Jimmy Smith to give us some opening remarks to tell us about why we've prepared this book. Thank you, Shirley. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Good night, wherever you're joining. Thank you for doing so. All my colleagues at Ilri, and indeed all of those who collaborated on this book, this book on the impact of livestock research, join me in welcoming you to its launch. The book reviews livestock research in the CGIR from the inception of this research to the 2018 roughly four to five years, during which over $1.8 billion were spent. Shirley already referred to the fact that this work embodies ILRI's predecessors, ILCA and ILRAD. Those two institutions had an African mandate and when ILRI was created, in 1995, 94-95, a global mandate was given to it. Shirley already referred to the three sessions which we will have this afternoon on the three topics. In addition to looking back, we will be looking forward. we will be looking forward to what the future of livestock research should be as we endeavor to make the sector more beneficially, environmentally, and to the people who depend on livestock. Some have been critical about why we spent so much money and time to publish this book. Why are we looking back? They argue that we should better spend our time looking forward. As I indicated, the book does both. We believe that looking back was necessary for a number of reasons. The book is an effort at accountability to the donors who contributed the $1.8 billion invested. It compiles and demonstrates and differentiates impacts of livestock research, which by nature, is more diffused than in our crop world. The compilation will facilitate better access to and use of the knowledge generated. 
and would help us avoid going over ground already traversed. Rather, it would help position the research we do focus on the futures chapter. It would be remiss of me if I concluded these few remarks without expressing my gratitude to our donors who contribute, contributed the more than $1.5 billion to this work. I wanna thank you for this contribution and for your continued contribution to ILRI and our other CGIR and non-CGIR partners. I want to thank to the editors, John McIntyre and Delia Grace Randolph, and the copy editors, Susan McMillan and Hector Patel. I also want to give a shout out to my predecessor DGs, boards, chairs, and board members, and indeed all the staff. I nostalgically looked at some of the names joining the launch today. Do let me also say a word of thanks to Ian Wright, who I asked to help me manage the effort to get this book published. Moderator, ladies and gentlemen, it has become fashionable in some quarters to disparage livestock production and consumption. Yet we know that whatever we think about livestock, good or bad, they're not about to disappear soon. New research and innovations will be absolutely needed, needed to accentuate what is good about livestock and ameliorate what is bad about livestock. Thus, whatever our disposition to livestock, we are united in the purpose of the new research and innovations. These are to make the livestock sector more economically, socially, and environmentally sustainable. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us at this launch, Shirley. Thank you, Jimmy. Jimmy mentioned Ian Wright. Ian is Ilri's Deputy Director General, and he was the conductor, as Jimmy said, of much of this work. So we're really pleased that Ian's going to join us online, and he's going to give an introduction that will orient us towards what's to follow in our exciting session. So Ian, are you there? I am indeed, Shirley, thank you very much. So firstly, uh, I have to say it's so wonderful to see so many well-known names online. I think from California to New Zealand, obviously far too many of you to mention individually but you're all so welcome to this event. I'm delighted to be given the opportunity to introduce this book, which my background will not allow you to, to see, uh, The Impact of International Livestock Research, The Impact of the International Livestock Research Institute. Years long in the making, this detailed and fully referenced book takes a critical look back at more than 45 years of livestock research conducted by ILRI and ILCA and ILRAD before it, along with its many partners. Research that was conducted to help create better lives through livestock. It looks at the impact of that research across three areas, scientific impact, development impact, and impact on capacity development. As you all know, some 1 billion poor people rely on livestock for their livelihoods, their incomes, their food, their nutrition, and their health. Livestock, we know, are force multipliers. The job of Livestock Research for Development, our mission critical task, has thus been to support the world's livestock peoples, to deliver livestock knowledge, technologies, and policies that enable them to raise their living standards, to feed and nourish their families and communities, and to help grow the economies of their countries and to conserve their precious natural resources in the process. Where did we succeed? Where did we fail? Were the scientists pre pre prescient? What were their blind spots? What opportunities did they jump on or indeed miss? How did they manage to navigate the waves and troughs of funding cycles 
What technological bottlenecks did they face and what breakthroughs did they make? The big questions are, are the benefits detailed in this book commensurate with the 1.8 billion investment and are they sustainable? This book provides some answers. Perhaps more importantly, the book provides lessons and signposts about what will help current and future livestock scientists and food producers, sellers and consumers to transform the developing world's livestock sector into one that is profitable, safe, sustainable and equitable. The business of research for development is not knowledge for its own sake, we know, but rather actionable intelligence, big but also executable ideas. To achieve this, big tent coalitions have been needed that were both cross-cutting and cross-disciplinary. This book is a testament to the fact that the business of science is profoundly international and accretional in nature, with one result building on another, one partner building on another, one breakthrough building on another. So it is our partners, intellectual, financial, and development, to whom we dedicate this book. In the next three sessions, you'll hear about the three cornerstones of livestock development, health, genetics, and feeds, as well as the policies and systems that enable or disable sustainable livestock development. The book covers several of today's hot button issues, from climate change to food systems, to ending poverty, to protecting the environment, to gender equity, to antimicrobial resistance, zoonotic diseases, and food safety. The book covers livestock science from back in the day when technicians laboriously made DNA and plastic buckets in the lab, to today's use of synthetic biology, from communication by telex to today's ubiquitous mobile phones and internet, from a focus on male heads of families to putting women at the very center of food systems, from the physical to digital worlds. What has endured across all these decades and eras is scientific commitment. Commitment to building the foundational knowledge, expertise, technologies and policies for a better world. I want to acknowledge the commitment and the dedication of the thousands of scientists who have contributed to the research chronicled in this book. But I also want to recognize the thousands of non-scientists who have facilitated the research, from the skilled technicians who have worked with scientists, the accountants, the administrators, the engineers, the IT people, HR staff, the drivers, the security staff, and many, many more who were just as dedicated to the mission of ILRI and its predecessor organizations. As we make the transition to one CGR, the book provides a solid foundation on which to build a strong and impactful livestock research for development program. Indeed, the final chapter, which lays out a vision for future livestock research, provided the building blocks for the development of the new <laughs> livestock research initiatives within the one CGR portfolio. We all want to build a better, more sustainable and fairer food system. This book is helping CGIR and its many partners to build the evidence base needed to ensure that livestock plays its critical role in those future food systems. Thanks, Shirley, and back to you. Thanks very much indeed, Ian. And indeed, we would have loved to have so many of those thousands of people to be part of this, sharing their stories. Not possible, even the authors and contributors to the book. But as we get into the science for each of these sessions, we're gonna begin with a short video where we did give an opportunity for some of the other chapter authors and contributors to share a few remarks. So as we begin our first session, Animal Genetics, Production and Health, let's have a short video now, I hope. Hello, my name is Cynthia Baldwin. I'm currently a professor at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst, and I worked at ILRED from 1983 to 1989 on East Coast fever, specifically the role of T cells and immunity to that parasite with the goal towards vaccine development. I contributed to chapter three, the impact of immunology and immunoparasitology, including tool development. Hello, my name is Samuel Black. I'm a professor emeritus at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. 
I also worked at ILRAD from 1979 to 1989. I contributed the chapter in Pathogenesis of Animal African Trypanosomiasis. I work in how trypanosomes uh, suppress immune responses. The goal is to, to learn how to prevent this and thus improve the capacity of cattle uh, to control trypanosomes. Hello, I'm Lucilla Steiner and I'm a principal scientist at ILRI. I started working at ILRI in 2009. So the chapter I worked on uh, was transboundary <coughs> animal diseases. And that's all for me. Bye bye. My name is Phil Toy and I'm a principal scientist at ORI. And I was one of the authors on chapter six of the book, The Management and Economics of East Coast Fever. Research at Ulrich on East Coast fever has had a major impact on our understanding of the disease and on bovine immune responses more generally. And it underpins Ulrich's role in the development and deployment of ITM, the only commercially available vaccine against East Coast fever. Thank you. Great, thank you. So this first session is convened by Ed Reggae, currently CEO of Emerge Africa, and Ed's a former ILRI Biotechnology Director. And he'll be working together with Ekta Patel, who's ILRI Scientist and Bioscience Communication Manager. Ed and Ekta, it's over to you for this session. Thank you, thank you, Charlie. Thank you, everyone. I see 278 people, wonderful. Um, I would like to invite first um, Ekta to, st to start us off by doing introductions of the panelists, and then we'll get started. We have only 24 minutes, and so we are already concerned even before we get started. Ekta, over to you. Thanks, Ed, and uh, you know, good morning and good afternoon from wherever you are. We're really excited uh, to have all of you with us to celebrate Elry's Impact Book. Uh, and I think most of what I wanted to say has been said by Shirley and Ian. <laughs> Uh, but just to sort of let you know that this session, which is titled after the first part of the book, Animal Genetics Production and Health, ha dives into several robust chapters. So please do visit us online and get a copy to take a look. But with us today, we have um, a great range of panelists who are or have been affiliated with ILRI and will be sharing their perspectives based on personal experience. So without further ado, I would like to call upon uh, Duncan Wangi from the United States joining us. Um, he's a research director and head of global therapeutics at Zootis. Uh, from Kenya, we have Susan McMillan, science writer and information designer, Ilri Emeritus Fellow. And from Ethiopia, we have Olivier Hannett, principal scientist uh, at Ilri. Over to you, Ed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ekta. Um, so um, without further ado, I would like to jump right into um, the conversation by the panelists. Um, the approach we are taking here is we will we have two two rounds of questions. Each each panelist has 2.5 minutes, and Ekta will help me to ensure that uh, 2.5 minutes and no more. Um, I would like to call upon Susan and ask Susan in this round one. Susan, in your view, what is the one impact attributable to attributable to Ilri over the years that we should be celebrating today? What is the one impact attributable to ILRI over the years that we should be celebrating today? And limiting yourself to the chap chapters covered by this session, please. Thank you, Ed. So as a communicator, I am going to celebrate what we learned and what we at ILRI and our partners continue to learn. And that is that <clears throat> the kind of mission-oriented research that we conduct at ILRI has to involve partners and it has to involve communicators from the get-go in order to succeed. And to understand where I'm coming from, we only have to look at a few of the award-winning projects that ILRI has conducted with its partners over the years. These include the, the Smallholder Dairy Project, as many of you will know, the Redo Redo uh, Project in Maasai Land, which um, combined livestock and uh, wildlife uh, preservation, the Index-Based Livestock Insurance Project, protecting people from drought in some of the most remote places of East Africa. The Food Safety in Informal Markets Project and the East Coast Fever Infection and Treatment uh, 
vaccine project, which Phil just spoke about. And then all of that research, if I can go on a bit, we also learned humility. In the decades before Ilrad, the predecessor of Ilri started in 1972, there was great excitement and confidence that what with our genetics revolution and um, our breakthroughs against bacteria, that we would get rid of disease. Some people argue disease was of the past and the future. And in the following decades, when Ilri took on two protozoan diseases of major economic importance and social importance in Africa, we learned to our dismay that that was not true. These organisms that cause disease and the diseases they cause in the environments are all complex and smarter than we are. So the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic has also taught us that we just can never again be complacent against disease, not about human disease or livestock disease. That is our job. And our job is also to remember, especially with COVID, what we're now getting is that the social dimensions of solving these disease issues is as important as the technological options that Ilri and other organizations are working on. Thanks very Thank much. Thank you. Ed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susan. Um, right on the dot there. Um, I would like to go to Duncan. Uh, Duncan, nice to see you here after many, many years. Um, Duncan, as you recollect, and as you remember those, those days and years you were working with Ilri and your familiarity with Ilri even after that, um, what, in your view, should we be celebrating today in terms of impact? And please, um, particularly if you're talking about scientific breakthroughs, please do mention what, where, and who in terms of um, beneficiaries of that impact. 2.5 minutes, please. Thank you, Ed. Uh, thank you, Hector. And uh, great to reconnect with all my former uh, Iuri colleagues. And congratulations to Iuri for the great impact over the last uh, over four decades. Um, I, I have to say that going through the book and looking at the impacts, um, you know, many impacts that Iuri has had, but I'll be biased in terms of uh, what I, I picked out as the, the main thing mainly because I was involved uh, in, in, in this research for some time when I was at Erie. And the one I picked um, is the, the research that led to the understanding of bovine immunology. Um, when ERAD was started and then morphed into Erie, there has been great work that has been done to really understand and dissect the bovine immune system. And this has benefited not only Erie, but the global community that works on bovine diseases. And to me, uh, that laid the foundation uh, to really look at the two key regional diseases, uh, especially in Africa and developing world, looking at ECF, East fever and trypanosomosis. And that is the foundation that you require uh, to, to really develop immunological solutions that uh, the Institute was looking for. So it's, it has been great impact. You look at the publications, it's great to see uh, Sidney Baldwin and, and Sam Black and uh, Phil Toy who have worked in this area and many other scientists and to celebrate what uh, that has resulted in. Uh, the development of uh, infection and treatment method of control for, for East Coast fever as Phil mentioned, uh, but also laying the foundation for second generation uh, vaccines for, for East Coast fever as well. Working in the industry, I know that having that foundation is very important to, to, uh, to put the launching pad for a successful development uh, of a vaccine against such diseases. Now, adjacent to that is the other aspects that Iuri has worked on, looking at the epidemiology of those diseases, uh, the immunogenetics, the genetics, um, the diagnostics for those diseases, and all that looking at integrated solutions for control of diseases is key because one solution is not enough. It's the integrated way in, in the, it is the integrated solutions when they come together that you get that solution that the institution is looking forward to. So really looking forward Thank to you. Uh, results coming out uh, from this research on understanding the, the immunology of diseases and laying the foundation for vaccine development. 
Thank you, thank you so much, Duncan. So Duncan, um, without even a, without a blink, uh, Duncan believes that it is the foundation that Ilri and the predecessors set um, in make, creating an understanding, a solid understanding of bovine immunology. And that has underpinned some of the subsequent um, successes that could also be celebrated, but he, he went back to the foundation that um, was um, has been able to allow us to do that. Thanks so much, Duncan. Um, Olivier, on your part, on your part, what do you think is um, worth celebrating? If you look at the, the entire um, book, what should we be celebrating today? What hits you as the one thing from your side that we should be? Thank you, Ed. And half minutes. Yes, no, I promise I will be less than two and a half minutes. <laughs> no worries. Uh, no, thank you very much, Ed. And, and uh, a great hello to everyone attending the meeting. Some of the names uh, are familiar, some of them are not, but it's fantastic that there are so many people around. Uh, I've been so fortunate to be associated with Ilui for so many years. But uh, the impact I would like to really report here is the development impact of the genetic programs. And this one really lies on the shoulder of two other impacts, of capacity building impact and of science impact. Without good science, without good capacity building impact, there will be no development impact. And what I want to emphasize here is or impact we had on productivity, on the improvement of productivity of our livestock species. Over the years, we have Italy has been engaging in new innovative breeding programs. It can be on small ruminants, sheep and goat, with the de development of the community-based breeding programs led by uh, Ikada and Italy, led by colleagues like uh, Okeo, uh, led by a colleague uh, from ICADA as well. This program has been actually is impacting daily the livelihood of people in today more than 10 countries. It is the dairy crossbreeding program in East Africa. It is the ACGG, African Chicken Genetic Program, and its follow-up TPGS program, which is now involving country in Africa, but also in Asia. It is a big breeding improvement programs uh, in Uganda. So thanks to the our output in our scientific output and our capacity building output, thanks to the partnership, the very strong partnership that we do have with national partner, but also with FAO or AUI bar, we are now implementing on the grounds the output of our science. And this is really impacting the livelihood and improving the livelihood of the people. Thank you, Hale. Thank you, thank you so much, Olivier. Again, um, um, you stayed in the, the domain of your work um, and you believe that Ilri has had great impact in, in the work that it has, it has done in livestock genetics. And you have named a few, including um, applied um, applications of those principles, um, those lessons in, in, in some countries, uh, for example, um, community-based um, sheep breeding. Um, in several countries across the region. Um, I'm, Olivia, I'm going to stay with you. I'm going to stay with you and ask you the second question. I'm going to go backwards now. Um, I'm going to, to reverse the order and I'm going to ask you the second question. Going forward and taking into account the emerging challenges that we all know and we, we, we face and we witness every day, and the opportunities that we also see, including opportunities that are technological, but also other opportunities. What is one area, Ilri, um, what is the one area that Ilri should position itself to make a contribution in going forward and taking account of emerging challenges and opportunities we see? And as you do that, could you also comment on two other things? What might come in the way as we try to harness those opportunities or address those challenges? And what should what could we do to mitigate those? Two and a half minutes, Olivia. That's an interesting question, Hed, because if we think about it, if you ask yourself this question, it means that it's we are not doing our job. Actually, we are already positioning ourselves. 
we shouldn't be thinking to position ourselves in some area. We should already be in this area. And the one I want to flag here is adaptation to climatic challenge. Climate change is affecting all of us. Uh, we all know that this week is the COP26 weeks. And we have at ILRI and in the genetic programs, but I know also in other, already positioned ourselves in basically making our livestock more resilient to climate change. For people attending the COP26 uh, event uh, in parallel to, to these events, they, they should go to actually to one of the link, which is developing ILRI contribution to this impact. And I want to mention two relation, in relation to the livestock genetic programs. We have mapped very recently, and this is uh, basically a, a this year output, we have mapped re very recently using cutting edge technology, the adaptation of poultry to climatic challenge. We are also using cutting edge technology to make our cattle more resilient to eat, to increasing eat. And these are just two examples. And this is with developing new partnership in this respect. And the two things I just mentioned is actually being uh, supported by a new initiative, which is the CTLGH initiative, an initiative of three institutions, Hillary, SRUC, and the University of Edinburgh. Now, what is on the way? Well, what is on the way ahead is the lack of time. We have to act now, as we know, for a targeting climate uh, impact. So this is the lack of time. But how do you actually address the lack of time when you can't compress the time 24 hours a day, no more, as we all know? Well, by investing more. We need to invest more in livestock research. We need to have more manpower. We need to have more fund. And only in that way, we will be able, able to address this challenge. Thank you, Head. Thanks, Olivier. So, so the, the one challenge, and Olivier said another thing, but by the way, he has said it is not positioning for future. It is, we are already positioned and we are continuing to position ourselves to, to be able to address climate, um, climate change. And um, he gave two examples already where um, some of those, uh, some, of the, some, some interventions are already um, underway um, to, to, to develop um, adaptation strategies um, uh, that will, will help to, um, to, to, to mitigate or to address climate change. And he's saying one of the, the, the possible challenges or one of the, the, the possible um, limitations might be not enough investments um, to allow, um, allow us to do what needs to be done. Um, to address this big global challenge. Um, Dan, Duncan, please, and then I go straight away to, um, to Susan. Two and a half minutes. Thank you, thank you, Ed. Uh, very relevant question, and uh, especially at this time, the world is going through the COVID-19 pandemic. So to me, one area that Eury should position itself is to contribute in the area of emerging infectious diseases. Um, whether it's for, for livestock or for, you know, as a zoonotic disease in the area of one health. And, and this is to, to really position ERI to be able to have the capability for rapid uh, response to those emerging diseases. I know the institution is already doing that in some areas. Uh, you think about ASF um, as one of the areas, but what will be the next emerging disease? So the institution should... Uh, uh, position itself to have the capability for a rapid detection, prediction uh, of, of the disease spread, uh, treatments and, uh, and preventatives for that. And to do that, I, I think um, the institution that is already doing that is to form partnerships um, with uh, animal health companies, uh, partnerships with va vaccine manufacturers, as, as well, and also national agricultural research, research um, uh, organizations. Because as we have realized uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the Western world was very fast in developing an immunological solution that is a vaccine. Um, maybe we were lucky that uh, it, it was much easier to develop a vaccine for COVID-19 than it is for HIV or ASF. 
Um, but see what happened. Um, the rest of the world is still struggling to get enough vaccines to vaccinate their population. While in the Western world, some of them have 80% vaccine coverage. So how can the institution position itself to rapidly respond if it is an emerging disease in livestock or a zoonotic disease to help the regional areas where the institution is placed? Uh, because I, I believe it's, cap it's, it's possible because we have the, the various um, uh, components uh, in the rest of the world and in the institution to respond to this. And I, th I think we can do this, um, the institution can do this by having good collaborations with um, uh, funding organizations, which you are very good at, but also animal health industry, which can provide platforms to do this. So really- Thank you, I, Duncan. I think Thank, you. For this. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Imaging zoonotic diseases, and you're saying partnership is, 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 is going to be critical um, in order for ILRI to position itself uh, to contribute significantly um, to, um, to addressing emerging zoonotic diseases. And you, you, as you say, ILRI has experience um, in that area already. Um, one Health, one health um, is one partnership, uh, uh, one partnership model, but also direct engagement of um, private sector, animal health, animal industry, and so on and so, so forth. Susan, Susan, we, are, we have only two minutes left, and actually I'm being generous even in so, but you have to come back, Susan. What, what is your response to this question about what Ilri should position itself to do going forward? I quickly uh, add, um, I agree with Olivier that we're already on the way, but three areas, educate the rich about the depth and breadth of material poverty in the world and what livestock can do, continue to do that, to alleviate that poverty. Speak truth to power, and everybody else at the same time about the blunt truths, the, um, the real power asymmetries, the real costs, the real trade-offs in smallholder livestock development, as well as the benefits that we know. And thirdly, leave no one behind. We're in this for everyone to win in the world, not just for the, the our target community, but for the whole world. Um, and also for the animals that feed us so well. We're in it for, for them as well. So what could hurt all of this is disinformation campaigns like we're having today um, or misinformation campaigns. Let me just say that the acceptance of scientific facts that you all know about livestock or about anything else, they're not a given. Livestock facts are asserted, they are protected, and if not, they are assailed on all sides. And our job is to keep speaking every day as a science organization. It's nobody else's job, it's ours. And then finally, what might happen is that humanity continues to cross the planetary boundaries. And I would say, well, then unite and build. Unite to, to bring, um, unite the natural resources of the rich with those of the poor, unite the animal and human welfare, unite environmental with socioeconomic benefits, unite women's empowerment and girls with men's and boys. Only if we unite all of that together are we going to win. And to do that, I think we need to build trust, we need to build bridges, and we need to build vision. Thank you. And the truth to power. I love that. I really love that. Um, speaking truth to power, um, um, removing all these boundaries that um, have actually atomized the world into different parts and different classes and different sorts of um, categories. Thank you so much, Susan. Fun, well said, well spoken. Um, I would like to now go back to, to, my, to my colleague, um, Hector. Um, Hector, I wanted to summarize, but I've seen you have warned me that we don't have time. I will not attempt to do so. So um, is there anything you want to say as we hand over to the next session, Hector? Uh, no, before we hand over, I just want to say a lot of people have uh, echoed the same things that we've been saying. Duncan also, Duncan's point makes reference to uh, sort of the, the, the position we're moving in and, you know, Ilri's One Health strategy does speak to some of these things. So the future looks good. Over. Thank you. Thank you. So with that, Hector, we hand over back to Shali. Shali, thank you. Um, we have overused our 25 minutes and, and over the remaining time to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ed, Hector, Olivier, Susan, Duncan. 
it was a very well used 25 yes, minutes. Yes, thank I you, the say. panel. Thank well you done. so, so much. Wonderful. Great, great job and really inspiring messages from all the panelists. Thank you. But of course, great breeds, healthy animals, they're essential, but we've got to feed the animals as well. And we've got to do that in the context in which they're raised. So I'm really pleased this next session is going to explore a systems approach to securing feed and forage resources. We're gonna start as we did before with a short video from some of the authors and scientists. My name is uh, Janila. I'm a ground up breeder at uh, Ecorisant. I work for the impact book chapter on multidimensional approaches for crop improvement. And I was involved in the work that delivered mainstreaming of uh, fodder quality traits in the breeding pipelines of grain legumes and dryland seedlings, and release of a groundnut variety recently, Kalinga Groundnut 101 in Odisha state of India. Adoption of this variety by smallholder farmers uh, would improve their incomes, livestock productivity, environmental sustainability, and climate resilience, as this variety is disease resistant, drought tolerant, and has high yield, helm yield and quality. Polly Erickson and I lead Ilri's program on sustainable livestock systems based in Nairobi. I led the writing of two chapters. The first was on climate change and livestock, documenting a long record of groundbreaking research um, conducted by Ilri and partners. The second chapter highlighted over 40 years of research done understanding rangeland dynamics and the contribution of livestock um, grazing and keeping to rangeland ecosystems. Thank you. Hello, my name is Alan Duncan. I'm a feed scientist at the International Livestock Research Institute, and I was the lead author on the planted forages chapter in the Ori Impact book. So our chapter considered uh, planted forages research portfolio across the CG centers. And we looked at some of the success stories uh, associated with planted forages, but we also looked at some of the challenges associated with uptake of planted forages, particularly thinking about uh, the evident success of planted forages in Latin America and delving into some of the reasons why that success has not yet been fully realized in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. Great, excellent start. And in fact, our session conveners, Polly Erickson and Alan Duncan, have already introduced themselves in the video, so I won't do that. But I will hand over to Polly, who's in the room with us, and to Alan, who's online, to take us through this session. Good day, everybody. So we're going to begin the session with a brief overview um, uh, from Alan Duncan. So if we could get the camera on Alan, please. Good morning, everyone. Um, as Polly mentioned, or as Shirley mentioned, this session is about the impact of livestock feed research at ILRI and the CGIR centers. And Shirley alluded to the fact that feed is a systems issue and it can't be considered in isolation. So yes, feed is about improving livestock productivity, but feed also has a strong environmental dimension. And as my colleague, the late Michael Blimmel often used to say, feed is at the very intersection between livestock production and the environment. Now feed is, um, is a key issue across all livestock systems and the feed options we have at our disposal include the rangeland resources, planted forages, straws and stovers from arable crops, agro-industrial byproducts and trees. And we have work going on on all of those options across the CGIR centers. From work on dual purpose crops to development of new planted forage cultivars, maintaining forage genetic resources, and also the governance issues surrounding feed and rangelands. And there's huge potential to, to transform livestock productivity through feed, but also to reduce the environmental footprint of feed if we can get the feed issue sorted. But that hasn't been easy. Um, there's been many successes, of course, and some of those are outlined in the chapters, but there are also many instances where feed options have not been adopted. However, successes are built from failures and, and part of our research agenda is building a better understanding of what works well, where and why. 
feed being um, a systems issue as well, illustrated by the multiple centers that are uh, conducting work on feeds. And a, a good example is the close collaboration between ILRI and the various crop centers on dual purpose crops. And we'll hear more about that from Janila from ICRASAT a bit later. The systems nature of, of livestock feed is also illustrated by the feed work in rangelands. Rangelands are essentially ecosystems and uh, they require interdisciplinary approaches, including social science to deal with many of the issues. The final thing uh, to say is that intensifying systems are constantly changing and with climate change, the incentive structures are also changing. So as systems intensify, there come tipping points where it makes strong economic sense for, for farmers to invest in livestock feed. And I think we're beginning to see some of those tipping points being crossed in various parts of Sub-Saharan Africa in particular. So with that, I'll pass back to Polly. Uh, we've got some great participants online, various contributors to the chapters, and I'll pass back to Polly to lead a panel discussion. Fantastic. Thank you so much. So if Michael Peters, Jean Hansen, Janilla, Lance, and Jason Searsley could please turn on your cameras so we can get this panel discussion going. I will be your, um, your questioner and I warn you, I'm very strict on time following in the footsteps of Ed. Right. So um, uh, Michael, are you there? Lance, Jason? If not, I will begin with my two female uh, counterparts here. Um, so let's not waste any time and get straight to Jean Hansen. Jean, you for many, many decades, I won't say how many, led really exciting research on fodder gene banks. But why, why do farmers need gene banks? Why can't they just go out and rely on the seed resources that they and their neighbors have been cultivating for centuries? Thank you. Thank you very much, Polly. Well, that's a very simple answer. The gene banks actually provide access to a very wide range of diversity all in one place, many accessions and many species. These can be used for selection and breeding, and then through seed production, they can be actually delivered to farmers. And farmers often have many problems to access good diversity, good foragers to feed their livestock. So, being able to access material from gene banks is very important for them, and then they can use this material to help fill their feed gaps. Let me give you an example of this, and this is the Eurochloa grasses. Back in the early 1980s, ILRI and the Alliance of Biodiversity and SEAT did a lot of collection in the East African rangelands. This material was taken to Colombia and Brazil, and it went then into selection and breeding. And many of these new varieties and hybrids are now available for use by farmers and they're already grown on over 100 million hectares in that region. So I think this is a very good example of where material from gene banks has really been able to be delivered to farmers and to be used for feed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jean. If I can now turn to my colleague, Michael Peters, a very simple question. Why do we need to plant forages? What's I so innovative that, about that? I think it follows up quite uh, well on Jean Hansen because I think the important thing is that we get a huge uh, increase in productivity with planted forages in terms of dry matter, but also in quality of forages. And we are doing that in a sustainable way, meaning not only is productivity and quality as feed, but also in, in terms of ecosystem services, be it water, use efficiency, be it, be it mitigation of greenhouse gases, be it soil fertility and reversing degradation. And that one works better with planted forages. On top of that, that we have different genetic centers of forages, so we need to move forages from one side to the other. Over. Thank you so much. So could you just, if I could, if I could trouble you for one more minute, what do you think has been one really important breakthrough moment for this agenda in the past decade? I think what, what is really happening in the last uh, decade or the last two decades beyond even the stronger focus 
or in addition to the stronger focus on environmental aspects, is that there is an increased focus on developing forages for specific niches. And that includes quite a lot of breeding, particularly of, of, of grasses, not only the Orochloas, but also Megatursus. And uh, I think it's quite important that uh, the private sector has uh, strongly got involved in that and is going to scale not only in Latin America, but is in Eastern Africa is increasing rapidly. And seed sales, particularly uh, in the last two years, are uh, doubling and tripling and quadrupling. And that's during the time of COVID, which is interesting. Indeed. So if I could just ask you one last question. In your opinion, what do we need to get greater adoption of these amazing planted forages in Africa? Uh, also quite an easy response, uh, for me at least. I think one is continued awareness creation, because many people don't know about it yet. And then the second, which is quite related to that and also links to the private sector, is uh, to go to scale. And for that, we need functional seed supply system, which also include vegetative planting material, because uh, it doesn't help you to be aware and then you cannot move. Excellent. Thank you so much, Michael. So now speaking of niches um, and, and true innovation, um, if I could ask my colleague Janilla from Icarset to kindly put on her camera. Thank you, Janilla. Lovely to see you. Thank you for being with us today. So the late Michael Blumel, who was dear to so many of us, um, was known for his groundbreaking work with crop breeders to explain how livestock are important consumers of the residues, um, which perhaps crop breeders might neglect. So would you be able to share with us an example of how this perspective and this recognition of, of livestock as important uh, transformed some of your own work? Thank you. Okay, sure. Um, look, the Icrasat's mandate crops, sorghum, pearl millet, finger millet, groundnut are important food feed crops for Asia and Africa, particularly the dryland tropics. And for uh, uh, impactful work on some of these crops, we have been awarded Africa Food Prize as well. While we're doing all this great and good, it's a conversations uh, we had with Michael Blumel, I think for more than a year, 10 years back or so, has enabled us to mainstream the fodder quality traits in the breeding pipelines of these food feed crops. That was really important. And one example uh, which I can cite is from my own work in groundnut, wherein we have released a variety which not only has a disease resistance and drought tolerance, but also has good helm quality. You know, this acceptance for helm quality as a criteria for variety release and selection has come from documentation of studies, uh, which uh, Michael, late Michael Blumel has done with the crop breeders. Uh, uh, it has been established that the milk yield with improved quality fodders can go as high as 11% in a state in Andhra Pradesh. So yes, I mean, uh, this, this, this collaboration and this articulation has really helped the crop breeders to mainstream the fodder quality traits in the breeding pipelines. Thank you. Thanks. So if I could just trouble you, if, if there's one, one challenge um, that you are poised to overcome in the next decade, what would it be? Oh, what would it be? So one challenge would be making this selection criteria cost effective so that we can routinely use it in the breeding programs so that when we have the product out for the product profiles for the different target ecologies. So, I mean, all these products have been tested for this and selected. Yeah, that I would see as a key thing for the crop breeding teams. Okay, great. Thank you so much. All right, if I could now ask my, my colleague Lance Robinson, um, uh, who um, has worked with me for, for a number of years, and we're going to turn to um, what many of you may not think of when you think of what do, um, what do we feed to, li to livestock, but the rangeland resources, which are so important, um, for example, in, in Kenya, where, where, we, where we are all, where many of us are based. Um, what, what's there and what's available for, for livestock to, to consume are found in, in grazing areas. Um, and this is an agenda that Lance has worked on for a number of years. Um, so Lance, let me ask you, um, how, how is the work to better manage and govern rangelands so important to the systems approach that we um, are embracing and promoting for improving feeds and forages? Please, thank you. 
So I mean, some of the other panelists here have mentioned the various kinds of connections to, to what's actually growing with the plant and what is the livestock actually eating, uh, connections related to marketing, to inputs and so on. In the previous panel, um, Shirley mentioned uh, about social issues. And in some systems, the main constraint, the, the key bottleneck isn't technology, it isn't the germplasm of a particular forage species. And in some systems, the main bottleneck is issues of institutions and governance. Um, land tenure systems that constrain optimal mobility of pastoralists, for example, preventing them from using the rangelands in a sustainable way. Even beyond rangelands, land tenure systems can, can really destroy incentives for, for farmers and pastoralists to take care of their land. Okay. Um, so, but then what, what do you think is the next big issue, um, the challenge that you want to address over the next decade for this sort of systems research on both rangelands and livestock feeds? I think one of the frontiers uh, for, for systems research in, in this area is, is participatory approaches to, to systems research. Um, in some ways, this isn't new, but I think it's taking the participatory approach back to its roots and then, but bringing it into to something more sophisticated um, and more ambitious where we're working side by side with the farmers and pastoralists to really do the systems approach with them, um, bringing in that community-based breeding that's been mentioned, um, participatory modeling. I mean, one of the approaches in the systems approach is, is simulation modeling. And I'm talking about taking simple approaches to simulation modeling, developing those models side by side with farmers and pastoralists, um, going beyond participatory mapping and getting into participatory GIS. Um, it's taking that scientific process to the farmers and pastoralists, a systems approach to that scientific process and doing it side by side together with them. Wow, that's so, so exciting. Thank you so much. Um, so if I could turn to Jason seriously, um, and uh, no pun intended, or it is intended, but moving on to the hot topic on the agenda. Um, Jason, you worked for a number of years um, to model um, the impacts that climate change can I get there we are hi Jason nice to see you uh, so Jason works here with us at, us at Ilry um but Jason worked for a number of years um with a with a model um and he'll talk more about it in a minute but it was looking at the impacts of climate change on declining range and livestock production and the associated ecosystem services including the possibly one of the top topics that we get asked about these days which is carbon storage in arid and semi-arid rangelands um, so what's the main lesson that you would offer from these modeling exercises for management and policy? Thanks, Jason. Thanks. Uh, our, the, the, the forecast from our model called G-Range, which is the global rangelands model, shows that in several regions, climate change will have major impacts. And this includes reduced productivity of rangelands and of livestock. And so these trends underscore the importance of effective land management but also that management needs to be robust to climate change and other stressors. And so as uh, linking to what Land said in communal grazing lands, much of this robustness will come from the key roles of producer institutions at, at local level. Uh, in addition, I'd say that adaptation to climate change needs to be at the forefront since this is the selling point for producers. Well, any mitigation that's accomplished will come largely as co-benefits of adaptation. So currently, semi-arid rangelands can support carbon finance feasibly. Uh, however, within the next 30 years, the rate of sequestration is going to slow down and even stop as they become more arid. Uh, that is for sequestration into soils. And so if we, in, in arid rangelands, our, our options are not a lot better. Uh, like, you know, deserts are, uh, are uh, although, you know, although under climate change, the arid zones will maintain their productivity, according to our forecast, but deserts and other arid rangelands are, are less vulnerable to degradation, and, and so they have less degradation to overcome uh, in terms of sequestering carbon into the soil, but they also store carbon slowly. 
And furthermore, we, we have limited options in terms of the models available, which need to be tested and developed further. And we also need to quantify the intensity of monitoring required in these very arid systems. And so in spite of the forecasted declines in range and livestock production, these land uses will remain the best options for many local producers as aridity increases, since crop production will be affected most negatively. And many farmers may in fact shift to herding as their crops begin to fail. Uh, and so in other words, livestock are not going anywhere anytime soon and before long they would be needed more than ever. So I would summarize by saying that getting the science right is the first step toward effective policy and legal frameworks for improving land management, to restore degraded land, to mitigate climate change and its impacts. Uh, we need to focus on the evidence. Thanks. Thank you so much, Jason. Um, and thank you to all of the, of the panelists. Um, they are um, uh, it's really, really interesting. And I hope that if any of you have uh, deeper questions or um, want to discuss the insights from the panelists more in depth, you contact them um, by email. All our email information is available on various of the CG sites. Alan, back to you if you have a last 30 seconds observation to make. If not, I'll hand it back to Shirley. Alan, go ahead. Yeah, and uh, you have 30 seconds for you. Yeah, there's uh, some comments in the chat around. Um, oh, great, thanks. Yeah, just, just picking up some comments around where forages are likely to be adopted. And I, I think, as I said in my opening comments, um, as systems intensify, then uptake of forage options and more kind of resource intensive feed options are more likely. But um, it, we need to be careful about kind of blanket promotion of of those kind of resource intensive options across all farmers and we need to think of of how to differentiate farmers and work with with uh, according to their needs using kind of some of the participatory approaches that uh, that lance was mentioning but thanks again to participants for the for nice interventions and back to you shirley fantastic thank you polly thank you alan all the panelists really really good so we've heard all our panelists, I think, of one way or another, have touched on the context in which this research needs to be delivered and scaled so that it has impact. So our final session is going to look at the breadth of those systems and policies. And again, we have a short video to begin with from some of the contributors. Hi. My name is Simeon Ewi. I am an agricultural economist and currently regional director for sustainable development for Western and Central Africa at the World Bank. I spent uh, 13 years of my professional career at ILRI, where I headed the policy and socio-economic program. My contribution to the book by John McIntyre and Delia Grace is about the policy and institutional options we identified to improve livestock productivity and the sustainable use of natural resources in the developing world. Catherine Hill and I'm a social scientist. I worked on the gender chapter and we looked at the evolution of gender research in ILRI, its predecessors, and in the context of the CGIAR. We also looked at the impacts of this research on policy, science, capacity, and development. What's the importance to understand gender norms and relations and to build on the lessons learned from the research to design and implement transformative livestock interventions. Thanks to a wonderful team and congratulations on the book launch. Hi, my name is Caroline Bossier. I'm an ecologist. I contributed to the life, African Livestock Systems chapter. The main contribution of this chapter is understanding how mapping of the systems is important towards reducing the poverty and targeting research in the livestock systems. Hi, this is Dr. Ramana Reddy, CEO AP Karal, India. I contributed chapter 14 of the book, Multidimensional Crop Improvement Program by Ilri and Partners. Drivers, approaches, achievements, and impact. This is a game changer in the smallholder system. 
Thanks to Michael for giving me this opportunity. Thank you one and all. Great. So to convene this, the last of our science research and former IFAD vice president. And John is, as you've heard, one of the lead editors of the book. And we also have in the room with us, Nicolene Dehan, director of the CGIR gender program. John and Nicolene, over to you. Uh, thanks very much, Shirley. Good morning to everybody. I'm especially glad to see a lot of the old timers from the uh, uh, ILCA program in Northern Nigeria here, Ralph Kaufman, uh, Ann Waters Beyer, and Mark Powell, among others. I hope I've forgotten anybody. Um, and it's really great to see that you're still an interest uh, in this work today to which you've contributed so much. Um, let me say quickly what I think the achievements are of livestock systems research were over the past nearly half a century by Ilri and its two distinguished predecessors. First, there is a characterization of, of livestock systems at all levels from extreme mobility to zero mobility, which hadn't existed at the time of about say 1970. Second, there was uh, an estimation of production constraints. This was of course the main, was to be the main focus uh, of ILCA when it was created in 1974. And I think this was quite successfully done by the systems research at ILCA and then subsequently by uh, ILRI with some contribution from ILRAD, especially in systems uh, heavily affected by trypanosomiasis and East Coast fever. Uh, a major achievement of livestock systems research was, of course, creating a new view of, of mobile pastoralism, which uh, in the founding documents of ILCA notably, and this was said by someone who later became a, uh, a chair of ILCA's board that uh, African pastoral systems were, uh, uh, if you will, reactionary, uh, unproductive, uh, almost using the word primitive, uh, and should be dispensed in favor of modern systems. And I think that the systems research uh, showed, in fact, the economic logic of these systems and the, and the biological stasis and their biological sustainability and outlined what could be a growth path for them that would preserve their traditional virtues. Um, I think there's also been a major contribution to understanding mixed wildlife and livestock systems, uh, as I believe that Polly Erickson and her colleagues mentioned. And there's certainly been a lot of work on quantitative modeling of animal agriculture and in defining the niches in which uh, planted forages or, or tree forages uh, would be both productive uh, on the crop side and on the animal side. So having said that, and I hope I haven't rushed over too much of my time, I'll pass to Nicolene Dehan. Thank you. Thank you. Um, what to say in two minutes? I was asked to say two minutes on, on uh, uh, when you have to cover 45 years is quite complicated and quite difficult. Um, gender research at ILRI, as in a lot of the CG centers, but also across the agriculture ecosystem, has had a lot of stops and starts, stops and starts. And in some cases, these starts would actually lead gender to go to the next level. And I think that's very important. And today we're reaping the benefits of this. Imagine ILRI hosts the CGR gender platform. I mean, come on, <laughs> thanks Jimmy for, for having the vision to do that. But I would like to start with a personal anecdote on gender and livestock. Um, and one of these moments when I think ILRI sort of changed its mind a little bit about gender and livestock. And I would like to talk about how a disease and a non-livestock livestock uh, changed Ilri's view on gender. It was 2007, and we had the start of avian influenza. So all of a sudden, we had an animal that was not really considered by Ilri at that time, to be honest. Even if you looked at the logo of Ilri, it was a nice zebu. Livestock, little things down there. All of a sudden, we had a livestock that could kill people. We had to sit up. We had to pay attention. So then the next part is, how do you deal with it? Well, you deal with it by finding out who are the owners of these livestock, women. And for me, that was really a moment where things changed about where women fit. Women were part of this discussion on how you deal with this disease. So like I say, that was one of those moments where we pivoted a little bit more towards trying to understand gender. But throughout the 45 years, 
of research on gender and women in the CG, there are certain levels, lessons that I do want to point out. One of the most important is gender is important in livestock. Women are important in livestock. And I think Ilri has been instrumental in proving and pointing that out, doing the research to show that. And again, we have several people to thank for, including Jemima Njuki, who actually put out the data. Let's not just talk about it, but put out the data. We still need to do more of that, but I think that was a big and an important moment. And that gender issues are important. And with that, I mean, not just women, but the fact that livestock is an asset, that there are issues on ownership, that there are norms and values that fit around livestock. That's important. And that these do influence productivity. And I say that because a lot of these CG centers were built on productivity concepts, but including women in this is important if we wanna move forward on that. The second point I wanna make is how can we leverage the innovations that ILRI has for women? Again, we have as an organization, amazing technologies, you heard some of it. How do we leverage that so that women can use them? And that we actually listen to women, what they need, what sort of technologies do they need to move forward in their lives? I think this is vital and I think this is important. And we have shown that ILRI is moving in that direction. Then the third point I want to point out about research across the, the, the 45 years is how do we pivot from very much a productivity idea to empowerment? How do we actually empower women through livestock? And I'm happy to see Alessandra who in this room who's worked very hard on that to show through the welly how you can do that. So I think those are important things. So what do, where does this leave us? And what do we do need to do now? There are a lot of million things that we can do. But for me, very important, get gender in policies. We still have a lot on gender in intra-household. How do we get them in the policies? Ilri's working on livestock master plans. How do we get women in there? If they're an investment, let's invest on women. We also need to start breaking up, like I say, livestock. We need to break them up to also women. Women are a diverse group. Certain women are entrepreneurs, others not. Let's look at that. Climate change, that's the next frontier we also need to look at. And then last and not least, we need to continue our work on empowerment. But we're in good hands. Thank you. Over to John, or is it Holly? Great, and thanks for that, uh, that nice handover, uh, Nicolene. Um, so I'm just gonna very briefly summarize the, the chapter um, that I, I led along with um, a number of colleagues um, discussing the research agenda um, on livestock and climate change. So what was the wake up moment for ILRI around climate change and livestock? Well, I think we all acknowledge that it was the publication of Livestock's Long Shadow in 2006, which was a very influential report put out by FAO um, uh, highlighting the, um, the, the, the very large contribution of uh, particularly um, ruminant livestock to uh, greenhouse gas emissions um, and therefore overall to, to global warming. So this is a report that as an institute, um, a, a leading representative of the research community, Ilri had to respond to. And so that started um, my colleagues Mario Herrero and Philip Thornton and others on a, on a, on a long endeavor to try to um, improve the data that were used in many of the global models um, that that, that come up with these, um, with these predictions um, and calculations of emissions from the livestock sector. So they spent a lot of time trying to improve um, uh, the data used in these models um, and make the point that livestock systems are heterogeneous and that you can't assume that European livestock systems are the same as Sub-Saharan African livestock systems. Let's move on to 2014 and my colleagues, Mariana Rufino, Klaus butterbach ball decide that enough with the models, we need to get empirical data. We have a real opportunity at early to set up a groundbreaking center of excellence, which is fully functional today, um, called the Mazangira Center. And we've been collecting now for the last six to seven years, data on the actual emissions from uh, Sub-Saharan and Asian um, livestock systems and producing very compelling results that are being taken up by the IPCC. But guess what's really on the minds of our government partners? and the NGOs that are lobbying um, for, for climate finance uh, as we speak at COP26. 
They're scared to death about the impacts of climate change on livestock production. And so I'm really proud to say that the last bit of this agenda that, that my colleagues um, uh, early have embraced is that we need to do something to help adapt livestock production systems to the current and future impacts of climate change. Um, and in the last three to four years, we've really seen a blossoming of that agenda and I couldn't be more excited. Thank you very much. Hi, uh, thanks, John, uh, Polly, and Nicolene. That's really good. It's a great introduction. And now we're going to have some respondents uh, to come in and give their thought, kind of thoughts and opinions on, on this area. So the first person I'd like to uh, bring in, so we're bringing in uh, Steve Stahl, uh, Joseph Kiraguya, uh, Esther, and then Gerald. So if you guys can all put your uh, uh, screen uh, uh, videos on. The first person I would like to uh, ask is Steve Stahl. We didn't talk too much about policies, but the institution and policies play a key role in scaling up some of these systems. Uh, could you provide some comments on that? Hi, everybody. Yeah, I'd like to talk about that. Um, yeah, we haven't talked much about policies yet. Um, you know, livestock systems are, of course, more than just animals, plants, soils, climate, but you know, an important part of them is, of course, people um, that actually make the systems work. Um, and a lot of attention of our policy research has been on trying to improve the lives of mostly rural resource poor people. And ILRI has a very strong and continuing track record of pro-poor policy research, but also advocacy. A lot of that beginning with the work of Simeon Ehwi, who we just heard about. So I'm gonna talk, heard from. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about one main example of sort of policy research and advocacy. Um, and this has to do with informal livestock markets. Um, many people are aware that a lot of livestock products are traded and sold either raw or traditionally processed. Um, these are very important for poor farmers, but also for poor consumers because those products are typically cheaper than the stuff you buy at a supermarket. Um, they're also very, very large. Um, the Indian informal milk market, for example, is larger in volume than the total North American dairy industry. Um, and these, we call them informal, but and they're not all of them are illegal. They're just not following modern standards. Sometimes they paid local taxes and fees and so on. Um, and so, but the issue with these markets is often they are um, considered as illegal or unwanted. And so policies tend to try to suppress them. And that has impacts on the actors in those markets um, to their livelihoods, it impacts farmers' ability to sell products. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about an example in Kenya, where raw milk in urban areas was illegal for a long time. And so police and officials would seize milk and containers from traders, which would cause problems in the market, it raised the cost of doing business, it affected livelihoods. And so we set about in the smallholder dairy project led by Bill Thorpe at the time, um, a partnership with the Ministry of Agriculture and CARI, the Kenya National Agriculture Research Institution. You just, uh, and, we'll have to shorten it up to uh, just for, so to okay. give everybody an opportunity. So anyway, we what we did is we produced a lot of good information. It, first of all, showing that the health risks of raw milk were limited but also we showed that they had very important livelihood and employment implications. And the NGO partners developed training and certification approach to dealing with informal traders. But the key message here was that we had very credible advocacy partners. And so the message here, and, and eventually the policies were changed, independent analysis showed that the the economy benefited by over $30 million per year um, because of the reduced costs in the market. But the main message is that for policy change and advocacy, you need credible information, but you also need very strong advocacy partners, partners, national partners, local partners that have a credible and strong voice at the policy level. 
Uh, thank thanks, you. Steve. That, that's great. Thank you, Steve. Joseph, just to follow up on that, I think uh, Steve laid out that main message that, you know, we really need credible evidence and partners. How are you dealing with that in some of your work at the national and regional level? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Michael, and I'm pleased to be uh, here uh, and participating in this event. So let me preface my remarks by uh, saying that policy research at Erie uh, has one of its goals as creating an enabling environment that allows livestock or animal agriculture to contribute to uh, development goals. And uh, uh, it has put together considerable evidence that uh, with more investments, uh, livestock can provide uh, a pathway out of poverty. Um, I think we have been talking about better life through uh, livestock. However, it has been difficult uh, uh, to attract investments, uh, both from private and public sectors including official development assist, uh, uh, assistance into the livestock sector, leading to what we all observe, chronic underinvestment uh, in the sector. So this situation is partly because either the, the evidence is insufficient or it is not presented in a form that enables stakeholders, especially ministries of livestock, to engage with planning and budget processes in their countries. And therefore, the work that ERI is doing and livestock master plans is instrumental increasingly um, in enabling uh, a demonstration with evidence that livestock can contribute to uh, development goals, uh, poverty reduction, economic growth, equity, uh, nutrition, food security, and so on. So, but also including regional and uh, uh, global commitments such as CADEP in Africa and the SDGs. So the, the, the process involves identifying policy or combinations of policy, uh, institutional and technological interventions uh, together with their costs and benefits that allow a country to develop uh, five-year uh, investment roadmaps. And these roadmaps are very species, species specific priority value chains, could be by species or by uh, commodities. Um, these are country-owned investment roadmaps because the co-creation process involves all the stakeholders. So that uh, process is allowing evidence to really assist uh, stakeholders, especially livestock ministries, to engage outside of the livestock forums and actually talk to treasuries, talk to planning commissions, and so on. Um, one of the so, areas so that please, we... Uh, okay. please, uh, please hurry it up. Yeah, we have sure, to move yeah. on. To that yeah. so. One of the areas that we have had some good traction is working in partnership with the African Union uh, Intra-Africa uh, Bureau for Animal Resources to help countries develop LMP so that they can uh, better incorporate livestock in national investment plans and also in the CADEP biannual review process. So let me close by saying that, you know, this process uh, requires good data at country level as well as capacity at local level and therefore we need continued investments in this area. Thank you very much, Mike. Ah, thanks a lot, Joseph. Uh, moving on, we'd like to bring in Esther to talk a little bit in response to some of the comments Nicolene made uh, around uh, gender inequity. Esther, would you like to respond? Yes, thank you very much for the opportunity to participate. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good evening, uh, good day, wherever you're joining us from. It's indeed a delight to participate in this panel and to see, as Nicolene has presented, that we have moved many steps, the stops and the beginnings in the history of participatory and gender research from the time when ILCA Systems Research drew attention to the importance of women in pastoral livelihoods in East and Western Africa. And uh, since Nicolene has focused on the history and the impact, I would like to request that I look at the 
aspirations that we have. As the gender team here at ILRI, uh, with the support from our institution, our leaders and our donors, and of course, in collaboration with our very valued partners for moving the gender agenda forward, appreciating that we stand on the shoulders of giants who have beaten the path for us and we are able to walk today. And we have a question that is guiding our thinking currently, and this is uh, basically the relationship between empowerment and drive stock in different contexts, different species, different value chains. And the question we are pursuing is how livestock development impacts women's empowerment. And we are also flipping that to look at how women's empowerment then impacts livestock development. We are pushing this understanding to go beyond the livestock production node and consider even women participation in livestock businesses. And we hope that we can be able to do this in an integrated and strategic way. And we are challenging ourselves not to settle for only accommodative approaches that respond to the specific needs and realities of men and women that are based on the existing or current social and economic structures, but to move the frontier to increased engagement on research on gender transformative approaches, where we aim to challenge restrictive social norms and structures and reconstructing norms and behaviors that advance capacities of livestock systems in different contexts to improve livelihoods, especially for women specifically and for community generally. I want to finish my comments by appreciating that in the last four to five years, the gender scientific capacity is well immersed in the key program areas of ERU research, uh, including the environment team, genetics, health, feeds and forages, which we believe leads to consolidation and prioritize of integrated and strategic gender research focus in those programs. We hope for provision of uh, data of white quality that is comparable across programs, designing and testing gender responsive solutions. And we continue to trust that there'll be continued funding and institutional support that will give the gender research in the livestock community an opportunity to strengthen empowerment of women through livestock. Thank you very much. Excellent, thank you so much, uh, Esther. Uh, so the, the final respondent that we have is uh, uh, Gerald Nelson. And Gerald, you know, we heard a lot from uh, Polly and then the earlier session from uh, uh, Lance as well about climate change. What do you see as some of the big issues in climate change and maybe even looking at into the future? Right. Um, the timing of this, uh, this uh, session on it, the same time the COP26 is going on seems entirely appropriate. Um, and I wanted to start by making an overarching statement about the importance of the CG research on livestock broadly defined, not just on cattle. Ilri has done wonderful work and his predecessor done wonderful work on, on cattle, but the diversity of livestock, the types of livestock already being used for food, nutrient dense sources of foods as well as income um, is much larger than that. And the diversity of the animals that are being used for food as well as their differential responses to climate change things will be important to expand the potential for adaption as well as reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, uh, I've posted in the, the chat space a paper that some that, will ha that has many familiar names on it from those of you who've been at Ilry for a long time that Philip Thornton and I led on the effect of increases um, of, from temperature in particular and climate change on the extreme stress that uh, was likely to affect five different species. These are just, this is just the beginning, the tip of the iceberg of the work that needs to be done to look at this increasing variability and stress on livestock, um, to understand the consequences both for you know, current income and, and nutritional uh, impacts, as well as what needs to be done in the future. So we're, we need to look across the species and their breeds to look at things like range shifts, changes in variety and changes in species. All of these are going to be nooted if we're going to have sustainable livestock systems in the future. So uh, right, what I want to end with this discussion with is the need for some significant data collection that, as far as I can tell, has not been done yet. And I would also add that, that part of this effort then will make it possible for, for those livestock efforts in 1CG to decide what should be done, but also to think about things that should not be done, even though that they're important because of a lack of comparative advantage or because someone else is working on it. So for example, I'd leave the efforts to modify dietary patterns to the food companies who have a great uh, expertise in, in doing this already 
and instead work with them to the extent possible to make them make the decisions about how to influence the consumption of livestock and, and other foodstuffs. So since the, the adaptation opportunities um, for all potential livestock are important, they need to all be looked at, not just one, to look for ability to deal with uh, various climate regimes. So do this not only for the different species, but also within the species, the individual breed. So, you know, widespread, we've got cattle with a lot of work done on it already, uh, but poultry, pigs, goats, sheep, and rabbits. Regionally important livestock include things like yak and reindeer, guinea pigs in different parts of the world. Thinking about even about raising wild species, there's already work going on raising deer and elk and others around the world. And uh, aquaculture systems are important that mix uh, the animals along with crops and, and fish. Gerald, please uh, finish up. Okay, we need to systematically characterize these physiological characteristics that respond to both short-term and long-term events and look at the effects of high heat at different stages across the lifespan. More work along this line needs to be done and it needs to be led by the CGIR in, in, at least in terms of finding partners to work with or doing it themselves. Thank you. John, just two minutes, uh, quick final uh, comments or thoughts and then we'll hand it back to Shirley. Sorry about that. Yeah, there's, there, there are two rather important areas which are major challenges in, in, to the future of Hillary, to the future of the work it does. Uh, and even to its future viability, if we're being honest here. And one is that we still don't have 50 years after the founding of these centers, we still don't have adequate data on adoption or use of technologies, either generated at ILRI or in partnership with the national programs, notably those in Latin America or in Asia, where various degrees of success have been achieved on veterinary and plant production themes. Uh, and this, despite spending quite a lot of money under the previous 10 years of the CRP, we don't have reliable uh, adoption data. And Ilry was recently asked for this by someone in the system and Ilry said, well, we just don't know. So then that, that has to be a priority. And the second thing is, you know, that, that, uh, that the, the effort to raise productivity and incomes and equity among smallholder producers of livestock, whatever the species, confronts the, 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 the steepening curve of climate change. That is a higher and more variable temperatures, uh, uh, in some areas, greater aridity and certainly more variable aridity and then greater risk of, of, of floods, all of which can be uh, damaging to various aspects of livestock production. And the question is, to what extent can technology research contribute to adaptation to uh, the effects of climate change? And to what extent can we really realistically propose that uh, technology can reduce the fairly small contribution of livestock to the global carbon burden uh, without taking important measures on the demand side, which for reasons we've all heard uh, might in, in some circumstances be very undesirable from the point of view of small livestock producers. Thank you, John. Over to you, Shirley. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, John, Nicolene, all the panelists for really throwing out some challenges there as well. Our concluding session is going to take a peek at how this portfolio of livestock research, capacity development, and its impacts can be built on in the context of the one CGIR research and innovation strategy, delivering on science and innovation that advances the transformation of food, land, and water systems in a climate crisis. We're first going to hear about livestock research in the context of one of the key science research areas, resilient agri-food systems. And I'm pleased that we have a video from the global director of this group, Martin Kropp. Dear colleagues, Thanks for inviting me to talk today at this very important hook launching. Thanks Jimmy and Ian and others organizing this meeting. It's great to have a thorough document describing the impact of 45 years of livestock research in the CGIR with partners and mainly of course in ILRI. Congratulations. I hope that all areas in which we work in the CGIR will conduct such studies. The impact on smallholder farmers and those living on less than $2 a day is why we do our work. We want to have impact. When I came back to the CGIR six years ago, 
uh, I was getting more and more impressed by the great research that was done and the impact we have through our partnerships. I'm very pleased that we are now moving into one CGIR where we will work much more uh, interdisciplinary and across commodities, crops, animals and livestock and fish, and can even have more impact. And we will do more to measure that. So to realize our mission to transform, transform food systems for more affordable, sufficient and healthy diets produced within planetary boundaries, we need to have a very strong livestock agenda. And we have. This book is not only about the impacts of ILRI as a livestock research institute, but the importance and reality of CGIR research and its systems-wide approach. Many CGIR centers have played roles in livestock science, as well as being involved in developing integrated approaches to livestock, crop and silvo pastoral systems. And I'm glad to see staff from ICADA, from Equisat, from the Alliance of Biodiversity and SIAT, on the panels and many of whom were integral to the work described in the book. Livestock plays a multifunctional and problem-solving role in development. For people and communities in poorer countries, livestock remain living assets and staple goods, sources of nutrition and income of course, insurance against shocks as well, and key components of sustainable mixed crop livestock systems. These are very important globally. For food systems in the future will need to feed more people and livestock is a central element to this providing healthy milk, meat and eggs. The challenge is this we have, will have to be done whilst mitigating the negative impacts of livestock productions, especially in relation to climate change. As we know, a key topic discussed this week in Glasgow. For this reason, livestock is fundamental to deliver the resilient agri-food systems agenda and how it contributes to the one CGIR strategy for 2030 and the CGIR's five impact areas, nutrition, health and poverty and food security, poverty reduction, livelihoods and jobs, gender equality, youth and inclusion, uh, climate adaptation and mitigation, of course, and environmental health and biodiversity. The resilient agri-food systems agenda will develop and deliver technologies, practices and climate risk management strategies that will measurably increase productivity, the resilience and the incomes at the same time contribute to sustainable sustainability goals. The research described in the book has provided a great foundation that has shaped many of the newly developed research initiatives in the one CJR, including three livestock initiatives that are central to this full portfolio. Now, drawing the work described on the book on zoonosis, food safety and animal disease lays the ground for the initiative One Health, which will tackle issues around pandemics and provides a new focus on the economics and environmental dimensions of One Health. I don't have to explain how important that is today. Another exciting new initiative is on livestock and climate change. As Polly has mentioned, this will deliver actionable climate smart solutions for low income countries. This is the first livestock focused climate initiative of the CGIR. The third initiative focused on livestock is on animal productivity, contributing to transforming livestock sectors in target countries to make them more productive, resilient, equitable, and sustainable. This initiative builds on the extensive work talked about today on cr crop livestock systems at the field level, whilst recognizing the need to go to scale through policy engagement and value chain development. For livestock systems to thrive, we need to include women in any research as they contribute a significant amount of labor in the system. I am proud to note that gender plays an integral role across all the initiatives. Research on livestock has highlighted the hidden role of women, but also the interplay between labor and the benefits of women, where in agriculture, women often put a lot of labor, but do not always get the benefits of the results of their labor. Again, I would like to congratulate Ilri uh, on this incredible book, highlighting the impacts of livestock research and development that has exemplified the sound basis for livestock research in future food systems. And I'm so happy that ILRI as a whole and livestock research is part of the resilient agri-food systems 
uh, science area that I'm leading. As I said, in the new portfolio, we have a stronger theory of change and we will design systems with which we can determine ex post the impact of the work we do with our partners. In the book, it's mentioned that we did not put maybe enough uh, time and effort in measuring the impact. But of course, we had a lot of impact, much more than uh, I expected also. But the key is a new agenda that we do this together with our partners. Um, so congratulations again with this book. It's a milestone, very important. And let's hope that this is an example for other areas within the CGIR. Thank you. Great, excellent start to this closing session. I hope we're now being joined by Kundavi. Kundavi Kadirisan is the one CGIR Managing Director for Global Engagement and Innovation. Kundavi, you're there, excellent, thank you. And thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule at COP to be with us uh, this afternoon. Jimmy, would you also like to join for this conversation? Kundavi, I'm just going to bounce a few questions between you and Jimmy in this session. So in this role as managing director, one of your big challenges is to raise resources for that whole ambitious 1CG agenda. And we just heard from Martin how relevant that work is to deliver on the development agenda. How do you make that link with financing and resourcing? Thank you very much, uh, Shirley. Again, I'm connecting from a very quiet corner, supposed to be quiet, at the COP26. I hope you guys can hear me in, in Glasgow. But so, so sorry for not being able to join for the entire session, but at least I heard bits and pieces of it in the last half hour. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Jimmy and the Ildry team for really putting together such an impressive uh, book worked for many years, I am sure, and bringing together a whole lot of lessons based on some very rigorous work. And again, I also wanted to congratulate and thank John, John, my former boss at the World Bank, uh, for leading this work. Uh, great to be at a forum like this together with you, John. Uh, John is such a sharp and analytical mind and to have led this work with an impressive team. Uh, we really have a great uh, opportunity to take this work forward. So overall, great uh, appreciation for the work that has been done so far. To your answer your question, Shirley, I think uh, investment in glo global livestock research, the report talks about it, that uh, it was really worthwhile and it will be. And uh, it also shows that over the last uh, several years, since 1975, close to 1.8 billion in, uh, has been invested in livestock. Uh, in CGI, our own research on all the work that we have done, it also has uh, shown that there is the, the, the cost benefit ratio of one is to 10 for every dollar spent, $10 is something that we see. But what we heard, from John uh, and also Joseph Terugia is actually raising a separate set of issues because now a lot more funders and uh, constituency, particularly governments and communities, want to show what's the impact that we are showing in investment and development impact becoming a change, biodiversity, health complex set of issues are at play. So these interlinked uh, challenges of today links a lot more rigorous review in, in that sense to make that link between investment and impact. So what uh, I would really say is to do much more rigorous evidence-based work. Yesterday I was at this event with the community Jamil organized uh, along with Ildri and the University of Edinburgh going to do a lot more work on the evidence and data side of it and to bring that point that what John McIntyre was talking about that we don't have the data on adoption itself. Let's try and focus on this aspect because I will make that 
think of investment to impact, it'll be very hard for like to make is how do we communicate these messages? And I think Joseph also made that point. Who do we make? those uh, uh, messages, investment, impact, and therefore more must be paying more attention, particularly in one CGIR. Thank you. Back to you. Thanks. Thanks, Kundavi. And let me ask Jimmy, you've often quoted those ODA, DAC investment figures that tell us investment in livestock has been far, far less than its contributions, even just to ag GDP. So what would you add to what Kundavi's just highlighted? Yeah, well, more money, more investment, okay. for sure. Uh, you'd say, what next? Um, although the figures is 1.8 billion over four to five years, I think there are much better mathematicians in the room than I, I am. But that sounds to me like just about 40 million a year. 40 million a year over the whole world on so many things is not a lot of money. So it's, it's with great skill that our staff, yeah. past and present, have been trying to, to focus on, the, on this. So we, we, need, we need more investments, not only by ODA, but by governments themselves who think livestock are important in their economies and, 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 and other, in other ways. Um, the point is made that we have not worked sufficiently hard on discerning the impacts. Yeah. And this is partly due to the fact that in the early days of the CGIAR, it was upstream work that was sort of intended to be handed off to national programs who will then do the scaling and look at the impacts and so on. Over time, donors have de demanded more than, than this approach. And so we're much more into facilitating scaling and seeing the impacts and so on. And I agree that we must, we must track that much better than we used to in the past. So develop the evidence that the investments are worthwhile, and I think we'll get more investments. Excellent. And Kudavi mentioned not just the evidence, but the need to communicate some of these lessons and, and their development relevance. So Kundavi, how can we, one CGIR livestock community help you with that. Who should we target with those messages? Having such uh, events really help us to disseminate the key findings and the analysis of the report. So in that sense, it, it's a very good one. And I think what the book also is, is uh, doing an excellent job in, in filling a knowledge gap on the livestock uh, sector and the livestock research. So in that sense, we really need to put out the information out. Again, this is just only the start of it when a report is written, but how do we use the information? And that's why we need to repurpose of it and really put it out to a range of stakeholders. Uh, what do I mean by that? Again, when I say stakeholders, you have policymakers, you have practitioners, uh, private sector investors, the development partners, uh, you know, organizations like us, how do we sort of make these um, uh, recommendations and findings of the report that is understood and be useful for different players? And that's something that I really would like us to be paying a lot of attention as a next uh, important priority, because otherwise all the hard work done in terms of this book would uh, not really uh, uh, bring really a justice to all the work done. So for me, uh, let's try and um, uh, look at who are the different audience. Uh, we heard from Joseph Karuge talking about we shouldn't we should actually be targeting ministries of finance and planning. They actually look for a different set of uh, issues than the practitioners. So how do we sort of pull out all this information and communicate in, in a simple and effective manner is something that I would really want us to be paying attention to. Thank you. So let's stay with that because we heard from the Food System Summit as well that a lot of attention has been given to country transformation plans and the 1CG has its new regional directors and is well positioned in that regard. How do we connect those? What we've learned from the work in this book and the science and moving forward in this new country and regional focus? Yeah, I think 1CGR, you know, we have a new strategy 
uh, that was endorsed by the system council. It uh, puts uh, very squarely the partnership. Partnership being uh, the research is not sitting as uh, research, but really combining with innovation and taking it to uh, with countries to have impact on the ground. So in that sense, to make that being a much more effective way of being able to deliver on our strategy, we have a new operational structure uh, of which the regional directors will play a very important role. Uh, we are also developing a set of investment plan that Martin talked about. And as part of that, uh, we will also have regionally integrated initiatives. These are uh, initiatives, the programs that really reflect the priorities of each region. So if we are looking at the Central and West Asia, North Africa, it will be more at looking at the water stressed region, which is the in the world. Then the research and innovation should look at the nexus of food, land and water as a priority. Uh, it will be a different set of issues when we are talking about Eastern and Southern Africa. So those are the kind of things that our regional focus would really bring about but also look at the, the external uh, continent-wide priorities. We have the Africa continental free trade area, so what we need needs to also respond to the broader context. Uh, similarly aligned to the African Union, that's why the engagement with the regional bodies, the national agriculture systems will also be extremely important. Our regional directors will be very work, working closely um, with the country context because, again, we see research and innovation, even at the regional level, is not enough. It has to be aligned to country priorities and country contextualized and situation. And that's where uh, the regional directors will be playing a very, very important role as well. So I, I see that the regional dimension and the country context one CG is basically to respond to that country transformational plans and very closely working with the national agriculture research systems and uh, government uh, entities as well. Back to Excellent. you, Shelley. Thank you, thank you. And that point about getting more specific, countries, commodities. Jimmy, how do we elaborate a bit more on how we can build in the book? to get to those, build on the book, to get to those kind of specifics. Yeah, well. Okay, um, I think Joseph started to mention that and several others. In the livestock, when we say livestock, of course, we're talking about six different crops, let's say. We're talking about red meat, which includes uh, ruminants, cattle, sheep, goats. We're talking about milk, we're talking about poultry, meat and eggs. We're talking about swine. So there, we talk about livestock, but there are many things there. I raise that complexity because it's also true that we can't do the same thing everywhere. We have to be quite targeted about what we do. And Joseph and others talked about the livestock master plans which you work with the countries to develop their priorities based on their endowments, their opportunities and constraints. And it's there that we'll be able to target things very specifically. So whilst we have identified some things at the higher level that we must do research in to adapt these to real situations, we need that more detailed planning. And, and that's a big, a good addition, I think, to Ilri's work to help us to target more, help the ministries themselves to have a plan that they could seek investments for. So I think we need, we need that as a very important instrument of getting our science into use and in, indeed informing what science we must do from the ground up. Good. We've just started. And we're not going to go on because we've hit our time limit. So, Jimmy Kundavi, thank you so much for stepping out of court proceedings, battling the noise and the internet and, and, and joining us. Everyone, thank you so much for joining us online from wherever you've joined from. I hope you've enjoyed. I hope you've engaged. The chat has been so full that Zoom couldn't cope with counting anymore. It just said 99 plus. Um, um, but let me as I thank you for joining, 
hand over to Jimmy for a few closing words. Thank you, Shirley, and not many closing words because a lot have been said already. We're not going to go over uh, the hour and a half. We talked about both the past and the future. Um, this is a milestone on which we, we, must, we must build. So a um, lot of work ahead, as Polly said, and others said, we now have the, the challenges of today and the challenges of the future, which includes not only our traditional work on poverty and food security and so on, but the issues of climate, the livestock effects on climate and climate effects on livestock. So we have a very big and important agenda to, to, to tackle. And the Futures chapter mentioned some of that. And others in the discussions today pointed out some areas that we must address. Um, all that's left for me to say now is that as I saw people joining the launch, it made me reflect on all the staff who've been here before, who contributed to this. All our predecessors as staff, as previous DGs, as board members, donors, and all those who contributed to this body of work and on whom we would rely going forward. I wanna say thank you again. We look forward to continuing to work with you on this new and exciting agenda that the livestock sector is. And I hope that today's launch, even for those who have left and retired or moved on, would have seen the important contribution that you have made to the livestock sector. So thank you for those contributions and thank you for your partnership going forward. So wherever you are in the world, good, good morning or good afternoon, good evening or good night. Thank you very much for joining. <laughs>